everybody. My name is Peter Werwan. I'm senior editor at Managed Healthcare Executive. And today I'm really thrilled because um, I'm getting the chance to speak to Brent James. Now, if you're in this world of managed care, you've undoubtedly heard his name. He is a leader in quality improvement and patient safety efforts. Uh, fair to say that he brought sort of a, a systems approach to quality improvement and patient safety and um, was talking about data and outcomes before it was fashionable. In fact, you might say he made it fashionable. So he, uh, uh, Dr. James uh, is probably uh, best known for his work at Intermountain, but he is now um, a clinical research professor at Stanford and um, a, um, uh, a frequent, uh, still a frequent uh, uh, speaker and writer about issues of quality improvement. So um, I hope, I hope this is a great conversation. I know I'm excited. Welcome. Thank you, Peter. It's a delight to be with you, to say the least. I'm looking forward to this too. So um, I thought uh, I'm going to uh, uh, truck out a, a rather tired expression and talk about 30,000 feet. Um, but I, I have, you know, as, as I was preparing for this interview and doing a quick uh, refresh on your career, I, I had thought it would be, it must be interesting for somebody like you who spent a career looking at healthcare in sort of normal times and, and quality improvement and bringing sort of a process mindset to healthcare. Then you have this um, massive event occur, uh, a, a pandemic, uh, COVID-19, it, um, it is fair to say probably the most uh, acute disruption of healthcare that we've had in our uh, lives and maybe in the last hundred years or so. Um, and so um, what, it, what have you seen in terms of your the, either the system that you sort of had a hand in setting up or have you seen a sort of a systems approach to how healthcare delivery and hospitals, I guess in particular, have responded good to COVID-19? How, how have these two, how has this event affected your, your, your life's work? <laughs> well, first of all, let's frame it just a little bit, Peter. Uh, truth in advertising, I'm part of the Stanford crowd. Some of my colleagues are officially on record and I agree with them. Um, early on, we had fairly weak data, but such data as we had, how do I nuance this? Um, COVID's a very important disease. It's had a major impact, but it's not to the extent that some of the news media and some other political leaders have pumped it. Uh, this is well within our scale, as it turns out. Um, the other piece of the frame, at the other end, give it about a year and it will be in a rear view mirror. And that'll be the really interesting time when things start to snap back to normal. But, but here's what I saw, and this was just plain fascinating. Well, before we move on, you're saying that maybe it's been overdrawn as a crisis, as a, yeah. as a, 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 a burden on the yeah. system? So, you know, uh, here's the reason that I say that. Now, I, I need to say this in a nuanced way. I don't want to take away from the impact of this. It's important, all right? Uh, but very early on, the early data suggested that it was not the equivalent of the Spanish flu pandemic, for example, back in the early 1900s, 1918, that it was at a smaller scale, probably, you see, I'm trained not just as a statistician, I'm also a surgeon. I was trained in surgical triage. As a statistician, I would call it proportional hazards models. Um, and you realize it's never just one thing, it's a whole array of things. And you're trying to balance this new challenge against the array of other things that human beings continue to face. Uh, and so the balance is pretty important to get that about right. Uh, every time we put emphasis in this area, we're taking it away from another area. You see, and so that's what I mean when I say balance. Uh, and having good data about where the balance lies is a really important idea. You're getting the balance right. Now, 
different people have different experiences. I've been working very closely with uh, Michael Dowling at Northwell Health. They were right at the, at the epicenter. They were at ground zero of this thing. Michael's experience was very different than we had here in Utah, where I still make my home. Um, night and day, um, he had a true crisis compared to our experience. We shut down elective surgery, uh, a lot of frankly, necessary care. I'm told that the proportion of patients showing up in our EDs here in Utah for stroke is down about 50%. Those showing up with heart attacks is down about 30%. It's not because those diseases are not happening. They most definitely are still happening. No question about it. Um, the difference is, is they're not coming into the system. And we have reason to believe it's associated with higher mortality rates. So we see a surge in overall mortality in the country but as you see that surge, realize that some of it, some proportion of it, I'm not sure how much, is only indirectly attributable to COVID. COVID cause it, yes. But it's because people don't come in for treatable diseases that are life-threatening, like heart attacks, like stroke. Cancer diagnoses are down. Do we believe that it's because cancer is on occurring? No. I've actually seen some cases where people were on chemotherapy regimens and failed to come in to get their chemotherapy because of fear of COVID. And the chances that cancer is going to kill them more rapidly are pretty high when you do things like that. See the idea? There are trade-offs, so, balances. So, so we, um, as we get some perspective on this, um, you, you might, you might see the we, you, you might see the emergence of sort of two mortality curves. Yeah. Um, one would be directly related to COVID, mm -hmm. and the other would be. Um, a mortality curve, morbidity and mortality, let's say, um, associated with the lack of provision of healthcare services um, That's for correct. all those other diseases. That's correct. So, so we'll see excess mortality, and we're seeing that, and I, I think that there clearly is excess mortality, but now my question is, is what's the breakout? I don't know exactly. Um, but it's all about balance and how you balance those competing needs. And it's all about messaging too, in terms of what we say to the general public. And some people I think have been professionally disappointing in terms of taking a careful, thoughtful, balanced approach. They tend to be screamers, they, their hair catches on fire. And news media to some degree, of course, uh, that's their business and they, they play that to the hilt. And, I think that we'll come to have a more balanced view along the way. You know, relative to that, we just had a study, Utah was part of it. Um, 10 major areas in the country. What we did was a valid random population sample. We tested for immunoglobins in the blood to SARS-CoV-2, to the new novel coronavirus. Uh, published in JAMA Internal Medicine a couple of weeks ago. What it shows is, is that for every diagnosed case, we have about well, 10.2 on average cases um, that actually occurred. Nine out of 10 people are not coming in for testing, even though they're exposed to the virus. The reason is their symptoms are so mild. All right, it, it changes the whole pattern. That's what uh, John Ioannidis at Stanford said early on was not well received. I mean, people didn't want to hear that message, uh, that he was right, fundamentally. Um, we're getting now data that shows that that was true. Changes the infected fatality rate for the disease uh, by a factor of about 10. So it changes your whole thought or approach. Now, the other thing we know about it that's emerged fairly clearly, yeah, it's very highly infectious in a population that's relatively naive that doesn't have existing immunity. So we see large numbers of cases potentially. Um, but there's a very strong age differential. You get down into the relatively healthy younger populations, um, well, it's that nine out of 10 who don't have symptoms bad enough that they even thought they needed to be tested, um, you see. And of course it hits mostly in people my age uh, who are in the upper age ranges. Um, and there it's, it's brutal, it's, it's much worse than in the younger ages. And so we'll, we'll learn, of course, looking back, our, our insight will be wonderful and we'll learn a lot from this and hopefully it'll inform us moving ahead. But yeah, it's going to have a shift. So we just have been reviewing, when will a vaccine be available? Now, later this fall, we're going to see effective treatments 
probably monoclonal antibodies should be available at scale fairly quickly now. They're getting close. They'll have side effects. It won't be black and white. Uh, we'll have a series of vaccines. Uh, we just reviewed the five front runners. Um, some of the early ones using completely new technology, DNA, RNA vaccines, as opposed to the traditional protein-based vaccines. Protein-based will probably be out oh, sometime late next summer, about a year from now. Um, but we'll have some controversy around them as they swing out. But we'll get on top of it. And when we get on top of it, we'll be looking back. And I, I'm really interested to see how fast it drops out of our consciousness, how fast we get back to normal life after it's gone.